All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and start from the beginning with the early Renaissance just because a lot of us lost internet connection as well as some of us weren't even able to join. Um, we'll be going through early Renaissance to high Renaissance today just so we can continue to move forward. Please take notes on these so that you have the information you need. Um, the sheets are located in Blackboard under content. Um, so for just to start, a little introduction on the early Renaissance. The Renaissance is really a time of rebirth. Um, once we start to exit the Middle and Dark Ages, we come into a time of um, metaphorical light, art, political advancements, etc. We see a huge transition in so many aspects of life pointing toward the direction of the modern world. The evolution of society and art kind of leads to a thriving economy, which in turn, as you may guess, always affects the fashions and dress that we have. Um, the more money we have, the more we're going to spend. So we see a beginning of uh, more extravagance in the period of costumes, um, whether it be in trimmings, fabrics, decoration, embellishments. Okay, so for costume transition, um, there are major evolutions all over Europe that are happening, um, and you have to kind of understand because of the distance that we have to travel and the time of communication or time between communications, things can't move as quickly or progress as quickly all at the same time all over the world. So you may see some elements still from the Gothic era remaining as we kind of progress through. Um, nothing just ends and begins. Um, so we see um, the major transitions start in Italy. So these large changes in garments were kind of paralleling them to what happened in Italy first. At the start of the Renaissance, we primarily see Italian textiles. However, the fibers used to create these textiles are imported from all over Europe. A majority of our information on fabrics of this period comes from artworks that were created during this period. Um, there were huge advancements in painting and sculpting where we see kind of blocky painted figures in the medieval and dark ages. We see a huge attention to anatomy and detail, color, shadow and light form. Um, and that gives us a lot of information um, that we need about what people were wearing. We do have some surviving garments, but this really gives us um, a well, a well-rounded view of what's what's existing. Affluent members of society would typically order their clothing from tailors. Um, they could um, hold on one second. This position had heavily developed during the 14th century and it was continuing to be refined. Those, however, in less financially secure positions would most likely have purchased the fabric and created their own garments at home. Um, but we also start to see this reselling of clothing at markets. So it wasn't uncommon for you as a middle or lower class citizen to be, to be purchasing and investing in secondhand items. Camicia, um, as you can see, this is the Italian word um, because we're all starting in Italy. So the camicia is also our contemporary idea of the shirt. Um, they become more visible from the outside of garments at either the edges or openings. Lower class citizens, you may occasionally see wear the shirt alone during hard labor. But if you were of upper, upper or middle class, this is not something that would be considered proper to do in public. These shirts, if you were a lower class, would typically be made of coarse, heavy linen. And then if you were 
an upper class citizen, it would be softer, tightly woven, um, soft linen. The sleeves and the body of the shirt were cut as one piece and an insert under the arm was sewn in to help achieve more movability. This is called a gusset. I'm going to go ahead and show you here in the second slide here if we look to the top left under the arms that are sticking out like an I or a T. Um, we see these little triangles of fabric. This gives us um, extra space for our arms to be able to move up and down. Um, we still typically use this in a lot of dance pieces or theatrical pieces where there is a lot of um, arm movement, jumping up and down, etc. in either a period piece or something that is more elaborate than just contemporary clothes. The doublet is a short padded close fitted jacket. Um, it could or could not have sleeves though. The sleeves are typically tied on. They could end anywhere from the waistline to just below the hip. And if they were of the longer variety below the hip, it's typical to see a peplum attached at the waist as we see here on the right. The close fit was attached, um, the close fit was achieved with four seams. The front seam, which would be our opening two side seams under the arm and a seam going down the center back. This gives us a little bit more play for where we tighten things, where we loosen things so that things could really start to shape over our body. The front of the garment could have been collarless um, and graduated into a straight edge collar in the back, but we do see several neck uh, necklines as we can see here, um, as well as some on here. I see a lot of the standing collar when I'm doing my research with paintings. All right, we continue to see hose in this period, though the shaping and function changes a little. Rather than them being two separate items worn on each leg, they've now been pieced together and sewn at the back of the crotch. To hold them up, it's common to see them attached to the bottom of a doublet with ties, which you'll see in the next slide. Most of the fabrics used to create this garment were woven and cut on the bias, which means they were cut diagonally to the fabric's grain. This kind of permits a little bit more stretch um, in the fibers. And they could also be multicolored or patterned if they are two colors or more. Um, we refer to that as parti colored, P A R T I colored. So here you can see on the navy blue hose here, we see them tying to the doublet to hold them up in place. We also see the introduction of a cod piece and this is because the show the hose were now conjoined at the center. Um, it's a triangular shape of fabric tied to the front of the crotch, and as you may have guessed, it is both functional and fashionable. The fashionable part being the fact that it could be made of a different fabric, decorated, embellished, um, an emphasis on male anatomy, uh, which we still see today. Here are some other examples of hose, 15th century hose with cod pieces. In the high Renaissance, we really start to see them become more and more exaggerated. Jerkin or jackets, which would be our contemporary term, were either fitted smoothly over the torso and had a flared skirt attached to the waist fitted over the shoulders and upper chest, then falling into full pleats, which could sometimes be belted over the waistline or sleeveless in a similar style. The jacket was pleated and belted. Um, that jacket is typically a little bit earlier in the era and evolved into a fuller peplum style jacket, which we see a little bit more in the high Renaissance. But both of these are referred to as a jerkin. So as you can see here, we have that fullness coming from the top of the shoulders being pleated down into a central belt, 
Um, and we also see sleeves that are tied on. They don't necessarily always have to be here, but for our purpose, I'm going to leave the sleeves on. It makes it a little bit less confusing. Organ pipe pleats, we see a lot of these in this period. Um, they're very round and vertical, emulating the shape of, you guessed it, organ pipes. Hoopalons become more indistinguishable in shape and began to look more like a generic row. They would sometimes have full organ pipe pleats coming from the shoulders, and they could be worn in all lengths. However, if they were long, they would be referred to as a gown. So if we look here in the center and far right, this is what we would consider a gown in this period. The patlock is a doublet that is cut into a deep V at the chest and is typically laced up the front. Um, I don't see these as much as I see the other doublets when I find historical paintings or preserved items of clothing. I do, however, see them in a lot of contemporary Shakespeare adaptations. A cape tunic is fabric that is cut into two semicircles that are joined at the top of the shoulders. The semicircle in the front would carefully be pleated into a waist belt while the back would fall free from the shoulders like a cape, as you can see here. Um, and we can also see on this Tom Tierney coloring page on the far right, we see it's kind of fitted at the front and then we see the back of the fi uh, fabric flowing from the back of his chest. Hair at the first half of the century, we see the hair cut into a bowl crop. This was done so the hair leveled with the top of the ears or slightly lower. And this was to accommodate the high collars that we see of the period. Um, as the collars lower, so does the length of the hair. For the most part, we see clean shaven faces or very small trimmed beards. We see the chaperone again in this period, although it's worn different than we saw it in the Gothic era. It's no longer, longer that hood with the lyra pipe falling in the back. It's now has the tail wrapped around the head um, so that the whole thing starts to resemble several different shapes of turban. There's a lot more fabric as well as you can see. Um, we see this in a lot of Holbein paintings um, as well as some um, Rembrandts. A roundel. This is a padded donut shape that's sewn to a skull cap. A skull cap is the term for a, a fitted cap around the, the, the top of your head. So we see a big donut. Big round donut. Here are some other examples. Look at this distinguished gentleman. Um, I love how happy he is. The bag hat has a round brim with a soft full crown that kind of flops over as we see here. The others look kind of miserable, but he however is very happy. We love that. Okay. The fez is a standing hat with a truncated cone shape. You'll see this again in the future. It kind of continues in several different variations. Here are some other examples. So for shoes and purses, we still see the pointed poulain, um, but there's a new shoe that is introduced called the paten or galosh. It's um, typically a wooden sandal that is slipped over the poulain to protect it in bad weather. Um, we can see Lots here. These are great examples of what a poulain would be, worn over what we see at the top here. Um, men would carry purses on their belt occasionally, and they would be heavily decorated depending on the affluence of the wearer. No pockets yet. Pomanders are small balls of filigree that contained a sponge that was soaked in perfume, and they hung from the belt. As you can see, they're beautifully decorated, but they also served a function of making you smell better um, when you walked by people. 
Gauntlets are gloves that are typically worn by nobility. They're made of a soft leather and had a wide flaring wrist. Um, if you've played any video games or you're a fan of any um, knightly uh, movies, gauntlets also can be referred to in terms of armor, but the concept is still the same where it's covering your wrist, it's coming and flaring above your wrist. The baldric is a band of leather or fabric that's draped over one shoulder and falls diagonally across the body. Here are some examples. You can have your sheath mounted on it, a purse, etc. All right, so there are three major types of collars we see on women. One is the bottleneck. One is a broad flat collar. This looks as though the bottleneck is unbuttoned and laid flat against the shoulder. And then we also have the rever, which is a close v-necked collar. It goes from nothing at the high belt line to three inches at the shoulder and around the back. The woman we see in this image is wearing a rever collar. Here in the next images, we can see a, um, an example of all three. So on the far left, we see the bottleneck. This is earlier Renaissance. We don't see as much of this in higher Renaissance. Um, the second one is the broad flat collar, which looks like the bottleneck has been opened and folded over, and then the rever on the far right. All right, the round gown becomes a super important and prominent garment of the period. It has a separately cut bodice with a center front and center back seam. The skirt would be flat and smooth in front and then pleated or gathered in the back, so a lot of fullness in the back. And the sleeves are typically narrow. And if we look close on this painting, we can see a mitten cuff there. It also has a very high, um, what we'll later refer to as an empire waistline, though we have not made it to that period. It's hitting right just below the, the line of the bust. Here we can see some other examples, one from Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. Excellent historical costumes um, if you're looking for examples of early Renaissance. All right, a major change in women's fashion during this early Renaissance is the extremely elaborate headdresses, and they fall into five main categories. The reticulated, the horned, the heart-shaped, the steeple, and the turban. All right, so reticulated headdresses. These are an evolution of the crest bonnets from the Gothic era, but instead of them being spherical and rounded on the side of the face, they're more box-like. The wired boxes or the side pieces are referred to as Templars, um, so that's how I will be using that term in the future. Um, they're attached to a circlet, around the head, and we also see a net leg covering for the hair. These are worn draped over headdresses and are called cauls, C-A-U-L-S. So Templars are the things on the side of the head, but the shape of this particular headdress is reticulated because of the angularity. All right, the turban headdresses become more popular towards the end of the earlier half of the era, there are padded rolls of silk or velvet and are decorated with pearls and jewels if you had the money to do so. A veil was usually draped over the top and it could either be left loose um, or wrapped around the chin as we see on item D. So as we go along the reticulated headdress, once again, I'm just going to show you again here, evolves the Templars, um, which we see on the side of the head, begin to grow larger and larger until they need more support from wide branching wires, which pushes it all up and leads to a horned-like appearance. They gradually rose to a more vertical shape that creates um, a heart-shaped headdress, which we see here. So this 
suddenly becomes so high on the head that we see this shape. This is um, a recreation garment, obviously, so the fibers and textures are going to be a little bit more cheaply made than if they were originally created in the Renaissance. The steeple headdress uh, becomes very popular in Northern Europe. It can also be called a henin. Um, it's a little bit easier to find on Google Images if you're looking under henin headdress. We think that eventually the two horns from the horned headdress continued to become taller and taller until it evolved into one tall point. All right. The butterfly is a modified version of the steeple headdress and was more popular with English women, whereas the steeple was Northern Europe. It consisted more of a cap resembling an upside down flower pot or fez as we saw earlier. It was commonly worn with a very transparent veil or call that was either folded and pinned at the center or draped to form two or three wires that radiated from the center front of the cap. So as we can see here, it's a controlled version of the call that we're seeing. We're seeing intentional pleats and movement. It's just not a super flowy, unintentional draped look. All right, we're going to head into the High Renaissance. This is a still from the Reign of Queen Margot, which is an excellent French film with beautiful period costumes. So, the Reformation, this period, also known as the High Renaissance era, gave even more way to social and political changes. We see the discovery of the New World, aka America, which widened our horizons of Europe and gave way to an affluent merchant class. This development of this class has a huge impact on the costume and social patterns of this in the following periods. Okay. Um, the dress of the earlier Renaissance still had a relatively natural acceptance of the shaping of the body. But as we enter the high Renaissance, we move into a tense distortion of the body. It becomes the clothing becomes more of an encasement rather than extension of the natural form. This creates a stylistically artificial silhouette and this really continues to the 19th century with the exception of one brief period, which will be the empire period when we get back to there. Um, so what is the major way that we create these shapes would be the corset. So this is a new structured silhouette. And this survives many following eras, um, and it really changes shape depending on the preference of the silhouette through the ages. Um, the corset of the 16th century was made from whalebone, hardwood, or steel, and was covered with a heavy linen or buckram, which is kind of a canvassy type fabric. On rare occasions, it was made entirely of perforated steel using hinges and buckles to close. Um, the silhouette of this period and the way that the corset was shaped really was stressed to compress the waist and flatten the chest as much as possible. This is going to shift. This will shift in the future and is ever going to change what silhouettes we want. So here are some um, historically, one of them is restored and then one of them is just surviving from the period and on display. You can see it's really pressing down the chest, um, forcing your bust up. Okay, we also see um, a greater exploration of slashing. At the beginning of the High Renaissance, we see more instances than we really did in the previous. We see some kind of illusions with the peaking of shirt at seams, um, but it becomes way more decorative in this, this, um, this period. It used open seams as a moment to accentuate the clothes under the top garment and later evolved into the use of panes, which are vertical strips of fabric worn over another layer of fabric to emulate 
the effect of slashing. Um, so you can see her under blouse or chemise is peeking through the slashing here. Here are some other examples on both male and female garments. Okay, during this period, another type of sleeve became popular. You'll recognize it from a lot of portraits of Henry VIII's wives. It has a wide oversleeve that looks like a really large turned back cuff over a narrower sleeve. The sleeve would occasionally be changeable and would likely have embellishment puffs or slashing. Um, and it generally ended with small ruffles at the wrist, as we can see here. Because they could be interchangeable, that means you have more instances for fashionable exploration. The décolletage, um, we will see this, and it's in the future as well. And it's uh, actually an accentuation of lack of clothing. So since necklines changed from a V or a low round shape, and they kind of evolved into a very low wide square shape, with the neckline usually arched across the shoulder um, with a frilled edge or partlet filling in the décolletage sometimes. Um, the décolletage is what we use to refer to the negative space of the neck and shoulders and chest left uncovered by the bodice. As you can see, we see that really flat corset line happening here. This all kind of emphasizes that space of nakedness. Okay, this is the farthingale. It could also be referred to as the vertingale, but I will refer to it as the farthingale. It's a conical underskirt held in shape by graduated hoops of whalebone, cane, or iron strips. Layers of petticoats were placed over the hoops and shaped an underskirt. Um, the skirt that fell over it is cut and shaped to fit these undergarments so that there aren't any folds or wrinkles. It could be seen left open at the front, which would reveal a beautiful underskirt that's heavily decorated. Um, and typically a lighter color. Um, it could also be closed though, um, but we would still see this trim down the center front kind of emphasizing where it could have been open. So here are some examples of the structure that's creating this super triangular shape. And here are some more painted examples of Really how st it's just so structural, it's so triangular, and this is how you're going to be able to identify this garment, is that super harsh triangular shape. All right, the Anne of Brittany cap, we're going to go over several caps. Um, <clears throat> this headdress consists of a simple white coif, frequently with a pleated frill on the front edge, as we see here. Um, which is covered with a band of cloth over the crown of the head or a jeweled band edging a hood of velvet which falls to the back. The hood is sometimes a half circle with a straight edge mounted on the back of the front band. Here are some other examples. The best way to identify this one is I see it as kind of square on the bottom. We're seeing the pleating around the face and the jeweling right behind the pleating. All right, the Flemish hood. This is probably one of the more simple caps of the period and was sometimes only a rectangle of linen carefully folded into a symmetrical headdress closed together at the nape of the neck. A center crease of dip in the Flemish hood gives a heart-shaped, a semi-soft heart-shape contour to the front edge that is typically associated with Mary Queen of Scots. So here are some other instances. We can see it's just a really, really soft heart shape. Okay. 
The gable headdress is another architecturally feeling headdress. Um, it's elaborately stiffened and wired to achieve its unique shape. When the front part of the hood is separate from the back, um, it hangs in front of the shoulders and is referred to as a lappet. Um, I don't have many examples of that except on this far right uh, illustration. I'm not going to ask you to identify the lappets, but look at this gable headdress and notice how it's very um, pentagonal. Um, very house-like. It looks very angular. The French hood is made on a stiffened or wired foundation of a curved horseshoe, as we can see wrapping around her head. Shaped, worn, shaped and worn far back on the head and exposing much of the hair as much as possible. As you can see, it's still cleanly parted and swept back. It's usually embellished, and if there were jeweled borders encircling the front edge, those would be referred to as bilaments. I'm not going to ask you to identify those. Mostly just want you to be able to identify this garment. Here are a ton of examples. And one of my favorite bizarre items of clothing from the period is a flea fur. Um, this is a fur of fine quality, typically ermine um, or mink with elaborately mounted jewels and decoration. This is a bizarre and optimistic belief that the embellishment would act as a decoy for vermin such as fleas. Um, here in the center we see a painted example of a woman holding a flea fur. And then on the upper left we see a historical um, preserved element of a flea fur. And then the two on the bottom left and right are recreations. Okay, we're getting into men's clothing here. Much like women's fashion of the period, men's silhouettes also become more artificial, and we begin to see super broad shoulders, large padded sleeves, tight jackets, and padded thighs. Okay, hold on. We're going to come back to this. One second. Okay. Like the jerkin introduced in the last century, it has a pleated skirt, which varied in length from the thigh to just a little above the knee. It can be thought as the prototype for the modern jacket. The front was almost always open or cut away to reveal the magnificence of the doublet and was tied at the waist with a belt or cord. Sleeves could be tied to the shoulders with laces, laces tipped in metal, which would be called aglets, and sleeves were occasionally interchangeable, giving the owner the availability for a more diverse wardrobe. Okay. So bases are an organ pipe pleated skirt that was occasionally tied around the waist. It could be attached to a sleeveless supporting top, referred to as a body, um, but it's not necessarily always true here. I look at the gentleman on the left. He's a little bit easier to discern what's going on. A body and bases, if they are tied together, are basically indistinguishable of each other. Um, they would match. Okay. The gown of this era was comparatively free from slashing and begins to resemble an overcoat. It's commonly made from sumptuous fabrics, often a brocade or velvet, um, something embellished and would usually be trimmed with fur. It's worn down to the ankle at first, but later a knee-length version appears. The knee-length version becomes more popular with the general, general population, while the longer version typically is worn by professional men. This is because of the mobility and the functionality of the garment is a lot more easy to deal with. 
Some gowns were sleeveless with wide armholes trimmed with fur. Some had large padded sleeves and still some others had open sleeves with a slit along the top for the arm, allowing the fabric to hang loose at the wearer's side, which is a style we saw in the Gothic era. Okay, the most interesting development, so we still see the hose, um, where are the changes in the hose, where the elaborately decorated a slashing appears in many garments, it was also seen in hose. So we see these slashes and these panes being added to our bodices, our jerkins, our doublets. And we're also starting to see this um, integrated artistic exploration of layering in the hose as well. Hose would be worn in two layers if it were slashed, um, an intact layer with the slash layer on top to show the contrasting color and design. Here we see some slashing on these two garments and some very interesting cod pieces, which we will get to in the future. We also see upper hose and develop. So the trouser portion of the hose began when the popularity of two pairs of hose re-arrived. These are called upper hosen, so this is a little bit later. So we've we're see we're still seeing the slashed hose, the full hose that I'm showing you here, but we're also seeing this start to happen. The two separate now stockings hose begin to be called nether stocks. So here on the bottom half of this gentleman's legs, um, bottom of the knee down are called the nether stocks. And then the upper hose varied a lot in style during this period, sometimes longer, sometimes padded and sometimes rounded. As we progress, they get fuller and fuller. As you can see, um, above the knee, we start to see this interesting kind of padded, weird shaping. Here are some other examples. The upper hosen are the decorated parts, and then the nether stocks are all in white. Okay. So the cod base becomes very fashionable. It begins to be excessively decorated and padded in all sorts of shapes, um, really accentuating that area of the body. Um, it's a short-lived trend. It doesn't last super long, but it is one we will never forget, that's for sure. Here are some examples in painting and a recreation item. cross gartering is not the leg bandaging we saw in the earlier centuries. This involves a garter that starts below the knee, crosses behind the knee, and ties just above. This is not the greatest image, but it's not super popular that we see this. It's more typical to see um, the regular gartering just above the knee. Um, as you can kind of see, let me go back. Mm. Not good examples there, but we'll see in the future. Shoes shifted from the pointed poulains to a square toe with an ankle strap, um, and then eventually to a more sensible round toe. They're generally made of leather, but some were made of velvet and highly ornamental. As you might expect, these are probably a little bit more comfortable to the wearer than those super tight points. Heads were pretty much covered at all times, both indoors and out. Only in church and the presence of the king were hats required to be removed. So it's a very fashionable statement. The beret becomes the most common hat for men. It comes in all widths and colors and was worn at an angle. It's similar to the bag hat and is frequently seen with a brim that is turned up all around and secured with a hat badge or medallion. Um, here we see it pinned with a feather. Here are some historical, historically preserved berets. And then we see the jewelry. 
Um, men would wear wide chain necklaces over their coat from shoulder to shoulder, medallions and hats and rings. Lots of different items of jewelry. We see a lot of filigree, um, garnets, emeralds, tons and tons and tons of pearls. Let me see, I believe I missed. Oh no. Okay. I will be going over the typical shirt of the period, smocking Spanish black work um, in the doublet. Okay, I had not transitioned this into our newer PowerPoint, um, but I want to make sure that we don't miss it. The shirt becomes much more popular and important for this period. Um, because it becomes way more visible, which means it would probably be more decorated, right? Um, so typically it's still made of white linen, though we do see, begin to see some suggestions of silk and taffeta, and occasionally various colors as well. The sleeves are full and gathered into a band or ruffle at the wrist, and the neckline moves up and is fitted with a drawstring or smocked which this is an example of smocking. Smocking involves very controlled gathering of the fabric, um, pleated and then stitched in very specific ways to create a super elaborate um, three-dimensional element to the fabric. The disadvantage of using this or the drawstring to decoratively fit the neck has one serious disadvantage and that means and that was um, that it requires way more fabric because we're having all of this fabric combined and stitched together. You're going to have to pay for a lot more fabric. Um, this makes it much more expensive to have the most popular style of camicia. We also see Spanish black work, which is when the edges of the collar and cuff become decorated with black embroidery. Super beautiful. Um, we'll see examples all over. So we can kind of see it on here. It's faded to a blue. Um, as you might have guessed, this was a style that was taken from Spain. This is another very important item of clothing. Um, the doublet is the next layer worn on the chest over the camicia. In modern terms, we would refer to this as kind of a sort of vest, and it continues to anchor the hose if they were worn long, um, and it sometimes would be uh, having a peplum at the bottom as we see here on the waist, and it was typically very tightly fitted, um, using the same kind of seaming that I talked about earlier. The neckline could be square, a deep V, with lacing or double-breasted, and sleeves could either be sewn on, um, tied on, and sometimes there was even padding added. I apologize for getting these to you a little bit later than the other items, um, but these are very important and I want to make sure that you have them. Thank you guys for bearing with me while I continue to deal with uh, being isolated at home. Um, Please take notes on these and have them for the next class that I see you just so I can double check. Um, this is for the better of you that you have these notes. It's going to make your life easier in the future. It makes it more easy for you to be able to discern these clothes from other ones. Um, I hope you have a great Tuesday and I will be seeing you with a webinar on Wednesday. Take good care of yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye.